Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about the software self-attestation form. Um, my name is Dan Lawrence. I'm the co-founder and CEO here at ChainYard, um, and I am joined with a friend of mine, Chris Hughes. Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? And yeah, your, sure. your title has changed a little bit lately, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris Hughes, a CISO and co-founder at a company named Acquia, um, but also a uh, recent addition to the CISO, uh, CISA fellow program at, at CISA. Cyber Can you tell us a little bit about that program? Yeah, so, so it's a new program they have called Cyber Innovations Fellow uh, Program. And, you know, for folks that have been in or around government, it's uh, similar to what they call, if you've heard, heard of PIF or PIF, the Presidential Innovations Fellow Program. Uh, but this one's focused on cybersecurity. So it allows them to bring in folks, you know, from industry that stay in industry. You know, you're not necessarily a, a, a full-time permanent government employee. You're what they call a special government employee. Uh, and you get to come to participate at, uh, at CISA, basically, and, you know, uh, bring your unique skills, abilities, knowledge, et cetera, to contribute to the CISA mission and, uh, you know, work with various teams at CISA. For me, I'll be working with uh, teams focused on uh, vulnerability management and SBOM with Dr. Alan Friedman. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. And with that said, uh, I do have to read a little bit of a disclaimer here, which is uh, the information I'm going to give here is given in my personal capacity and does not represent the position of the U.S. government, DHS. CISA and DHS does not endorse any product, service, or enterprise. Awesome. Uh, well, whenever I see one of my uh, friends or colleagues take on a role like this, I usually say uh, something like, whoa, congrats to CISA. So yeah, uh, in, in this case, I really do mean it. Um, Chris is an expert at all things policy, SBOM related. Um, so this is going to be huge for everyone working in this space. Um, I feel like you also have like five other side jobs that you forgot to mention here. You've got your own podcast. You just wrote a book. Uh, come on, give everybody the full story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been active in the cyberspace a couple decades here almost. Uh, you know, I've been active duty military. I've worked with the federal civilian agencies a couple times uh, as a civilian with the Navy doing cloud and DevSecOps and also the FedRAMP team. If anyone heard of, you know, heard of FedRAMP, I've been on that team as a government employee and then, you know, worked in the DOD space quite a bit. Uh, co-founded a company named Acquia where we do cybersecurity services, but I'm also really active in the community with groups like uh, CNCF or Cloud Security Alliance, you know, uh, contributing to white papers and efforts there. I uh, host a podcast called Resilient Cyber, and then I do have a book called Software Transparency coming out in about two and a half weeks from Wiley. Um, yeah, Chris is a very busy guy, so if you've done anything in this space, I'm, I'm sure you've seen his name somewhere. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about the new software self-attestation form that came out from DHS and CISA. Um, we'll start out with a little overview of what it is and how we got to this point. Um, and then I know Chris has a lot of opinions here, so we'll jump in and keep this pretty interactive. You can also ask questions in the chat and we'll get to those. We'll save some dedicated time for it at the end. But if we're going and uh, we're in the middle of something and you want to ask a question, go for it and we can, we can sidetrack a bit. So it's been a busy couple of years, I guess, um, in the regulation space, particularly related to software transparency and cybersecurity. Um, this uh, form, the software self-attestation form, just came out a few weeks ago in draft form. It's kind of uh, the latest in a long series of updates that all kind of stem from the, the one executive order 14028, if I got that correct. I've typed it so many times, but I'm really bad at numbers, so I might have screwed a couple of things up there. Uh, which is an executive order from the Biden administration on um, some cybersecurity practices. That was also kind of a fallout of the uh, attack on solar winds um, a few years ago. So an executive order, um, as much as everyone wishes, you can't just wave a magic wand and declare that all software has to be secure. Um, there's a lot of steps in place, a lot of uh, interactions between different government agencies uh, in order to get to a point where we can feel more confident in the software that we're building upon and our, our government and our national security is building on. Um, so that executive order came out, it directed a whole bunch of agencies to do a bunch of different things in a pretty intricate order, which is hard to keep track of as an outsider. I'm sure it's even harder for the folks that are working on it day to day. Uh, one of the first things it did was it directed um, NIST to talk to the industry, um, talk to folks working in the space already, and then start to compile a list of software, secure software development best practices. Um, so that came out a few years ago, the first draft, or maybe about a year ago now, um, called the SSDF, the Secure Software Development Framework. It's a really long, really comprehensive uh, draft of current industry standard best practices for secure software development, um, as well as some aspirational things. Uh, this is one of the first times for myself reading a government document like this where so much of it was definitely uh, out of reach for most organizations today. So there's been a, a bit of a hurry and a bit of a panic as folks actually start to read through that document. Um, but after the SSDF, um, the Secure Software Development Framework came out from NIST, uh, 
nobody's forced to really do that. It's just a document. It's a long PDF that NIST produced. Um, it's got some great information in there, um, but without another kind of carrot or stick, um, it's just kind of left there on the internet in PDF form for folks to read if they want to, or if they're bored on an airplane. Um, NIST can't just go either, uh, NIST either can't just go and force people to follow these standards that they produce. They just publish it for everyone to read. Um, so a couple more steps along the way from the Office of Management and Budget and the procurement departments inside of uh, the US government. But that gets us to where we are today, um, where DHS and CISA have put out this draft self-attestation form um, that organizations that sell software to the government um, will be required to sign uh, going forward for the government to be able to continue using their software. Um, so Chris, I know you wrote a blog piece recently uh, about understanding the self-attestation form. I like your flow, I like your description on it. You also had some nice historical context of some other efforts that kind of followed a similar path here. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that and we should have it linked here at the bottom of the screen for some of the folks interested in checking out. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think you had a great high level overview that we can jump into. Yeah, definitely, I appreciate that. And uh, as you said, there's been kind of a chain of events that have led to this point, uh, get us where we are with the self-attestation form. Obviously, you know, we had solar winds. And then the cybersecurity executive order uh, section four in particular focused heavily on software supply chain security. Uh, and then ironically enough, you know, shortly after that was uh, published, we had the log4j incident, which even put more emphasis and uh, concern around software supply chain security, uh, not just for proprietary software vendors, but for open source software consumption and use too, uh, or for proprietary vendors making use of open source software. Um, so we had the cybersecurity executive order, then we had OMB put out a memo called 2218, uh, which was also focused on software supply chain security and the government acquiring or obtaining uh, secure software and basically some requirements around that. And one of which led to, you know, this, this memo that has come out now uh, from CISO, the, this, this self-attestation form, as you've called it, and, and they call it. Uh, basically, it's going to put, uh, you know, software suppliers in a position, if you sell software to the federal government, you're going to have to sign this self-attestation form, whether you're the CEO of the firm or someone designated by the CEO uh, to sign on their behalf, attesting to a set of, you know, practices that they've derived from, as you, you know, pointed out, was NIST SSDF, the Secure Software Development Framework, uh, which, of course, draws on a lot of industry guidance from, you know, things like OWASP SAM and BSIM and other, you know, secure development uh, frameworks and uh, best practices and guidance and such. Um, so it calls out some pretty unique uh, and specific requirements. In there, it says that you know the the form is essentially required for any software developed after September fourteenth, twenty twenty two. It's applicable to any existing software that's modified with a major version change. You know, say from a two point five to a three point zero after that same date. Uh, it's also applicable to software that uh, suppliers deliver via continuous changes. Think of things like software as a service. You know, we've seen a tremendous growth of uh, you know, organizations, including the federal government, consuming software as a service, you know, rather than like self-hosted or COTS or, you know, things like that. Uh, so SaaS uh, uh, software as well, or software using continuous integration, continuous deployment, you know, as they call it, uh, continuous changes, basically, which is, you know, most modern software as we see the push for things like DevOps and DevSecOps and using cloud native infrastructure and such. Uh, it also says that uh, it excludes some things too, which is interesting, I think. Um, and excluded, uh, you know, software developed by federal agencies, uh, as well as, you know, open source or FOSS uh, software obtained directly by a federal agency. So rather than, you know, open source software that a supplier puts into their software uh, or their application or product or, you know, uh, service, for example, uh, but if an agency is directly using open source software, it doesn't apply to that, nor the software the agency develops directly themselves. Uh, that said, you know, most agencies tend to procure a lot of software or work with third parties to, you know, develop software for them. Uh, so that leaves a pretty broad spectrum of entities, um, you know, underneath the purview of this self-attestation form. Uh, it also does some unique things when we think about open source software. Uh, we've seen a tremendous growth of organizations using open source software and third party code, as you know. Uh, and it points out that, you know, suppliers using open source software in their products need to have to, uh, they have to attest as part of this form that they've taken steps to minimize the risk of using open source software in their product uh, or software too. Uh, so, it, you know, kind of uh, doesn't let them off the hook basically for using open source software and still has some requirements around that. Um, and then, you know, last but least, a couple of things that I wanted to point out, it also is, uh, it's, it's able to be submitted, you know, via a website that they're going to release or via sent an, an email. Uh, which we can chat about later. I think this is an interesting way that they went about this, uh, you know, given the push we've seen for machine readable artifacts and things like that. Uh, and then it does allow for what they call plans of actions and milestones. Uh, so if we look at the federal space, uh, if, you've, if you've done any compliance work for federal or Department of Defense systems, 
Uh, you'll typically have security controls or requirements, and if you can't meet them, you create what's called a plan of action and milestone. Uh, a poem. <laughs> poem, yes, a poem. So this is that you know it says like we can't meet this control or this practice, but we will meet it at this date in the future. And here's some mitigating or compensating controls that we're putting in place. You know, in the interim, for example. Uh, so it does allow you know some uh, leeway for agencies to make use of software from suppliers that can't meet all these practices quite yet. Awesome. So you, you went through a bunch of stuff there. I jotted down some notes. Um, you know, the first thing that jumped out to me too when I started reading this was the exclusion around minor versions and major versions. Um, as a software engineer myself, I know that a lot of those are just kind of made up. Um, do you think we're going to see a trend for agencies as a result of this to delay upgrading if it's that hard for, for major versions or for vendors to, you know, just kind of freeze that one forever and just start shipping everything as minor versions? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, you're pointing out the human aspect, which is people are going to gamify this in a lot of different ways. You know, if I can rename what a major or minor version update is from my perspective, everything just becomes 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and you just keep going, you know, and avoid, uh, you know, avoid falling underneath this purview of these requirements. Uh, so it's going to, you know, take some uh, effort on industry to be, you know, transparent and upfront about minor, minor and major version upgrades, as well as the government, you know, how they communicate with suppliers to say, hey, you know, uh, this is a, this is, a major version and we need to treat it appropriately uh but people are most definitely going to try to gamify this i expect uh and you know especially if they want to keep using a software if an agency wants to keep using a software and they know that you know maybe the the supplier can't meet these requirements quite yet or they aren't prepared uh there's going to be a lot of uh, shenanigans i suspect um yeah one, one of the projects i used to work on is the the google cloud sdk or the the g cloud tool back when i used to work at google and originally the versioning was set up like 0 0.1 0 0.2 every time uh every week and uh, we'd bump the minor version and then someone complained that it wasn't technically semver compatible uh, because stuff would break in between each of these so the team you know fixed the bug just by bumping the major version every single week so every week there's a new release of the g cloud tool and they just bump the major version so it's on something you know like 250 now and you know next release will be 251.0.0. So I think we might see some of those practices shift back again as a result of this. Um, I do like uh, that SAS is not excluded. Um, SAS doesn't have version numbers, so I'm sure they had to think through what to do a little bit there. Um, and SAS is, in a lot of ways, uh, a bigger security risk just because of you know that you can't rely on a firewall or you can't rely on an air-gapped environment just to protect a lot of this. And I know you're pretty passionate around the increasing use of SAS inside of the federal government. Uh, do you think this is going to result in uh, SaaS being even harder to sell to the government, harder than it is today? Do you think it's going to result in an increased amount of trust placed in SaaS? How do you see that trend shifting? Yeah, I, uh, I really hope the first part is inaccurate, you know, in terms of an even harder ability to get SaaS into the federal space. You know, as I said, I served on the FedRAMP team in the past, and FedRAMP has been around for 10 years, and, you know, there's about 300 approved service offerings in a market of tens of thousands. Uh, so while we want more, you know, compliance and security, it can also be in incredibly you know, restrictive to uh, getting access to innovative solutions and technologies for the government. Um, but I do think, you know, like you said, that SaaS is going to come underneath the purview of this and SaaS providers are going to have to start to uh, attest to these things. Um, that said, I think that depending on the supplier, the SaaS you know, provider, if they're a large, you know, successful SaaS provider, they may have some, uh, you know, success on meeting these requirements where if you're an, a brand new upstart, you know, SaaS company, it's going to be more difficult, just like much like FedRAMP would be more difficult for a new uh, SaaS company, for example. Uh, and then same goes for, you know, legacy technology and suppliers. They may have a hard time meeting some of this versus maybe a SaaS supplier who has more, you know, modern development practices and, and environments and technologies in place too. So I certainly hope it doesn't lead to more restrictive access to SaaS, but it could definitely happen, I think. Yeah, I think this is a case where it makes perfect sense. Um, the SaaS cell of the government does need to be secured to a higher level than a lot of organizations are doing today. So hopefully this helps. Um, another interesting uh, call out there in that first session on what this applies to, um, and this one uh, I was thrilled to see. Uh, I, I love that there is an exclusion for open source software. Um, it seems a little crazy that you even have to spell that out. Uh, open source software is provided for free as is with no warranty. Almost every license for open source starts out that way when you find it in a GitHub repository. Um, but a lot of folks gloss over that aspect of it. Um, and are used to being able to file a bug or used to being able to call a vendor when something they're using breaks. We've even seen some pretty high profile incidents lately of vendors blaming security incidents on bugs in the open source software that they're using. Um, I like that this completely clarifies right up front that as a vendor, you are responsible for the code you ship, whether it's stuff you wrote or whether it's software you found on the internet, on a package repository, or even on a thumb drive on a sidewalk. Um, 
Uh, what are your thoughts there? Do you think this is going to help the use of open source inside of the government? Uh, I'm I'm actually in alignment with you on this one. As I was writing the book, you know, I, I was finding it was very common for people to consider, you know, open source software maintainers, their suppliers, and they're not, you know, uh, you're, like you say, you're using this as is. Yeah, they're under no requirement to respond to you in a certain amount of time to address a vulnerability, you know, in, underneath a certain uh, uh, period of time or SLA or anything like that. Uh, and there's a lot of parallels, interestingly enough, you know, when you look at uh, automo automobiles, for example, uh, there used to be a parallel where you know you would take a tire or take some kind of part and put it in the vehicle and you say well i didn't make this i just i'm using it from so and so uh and it's like it doesn't work like that you you made the product you would decide to integrate this thing into your product you are now responsible for it and like you said like you know you're taking this as is and you're responsible for these components that you put in your product uh, so this is going to require organizations you know that are supplying software to the government uh to, to take some more rigor and, and governance around their open source software consumption and use and what they put in their products and uh, be a bit more, you know, prudent around that. So I think it's a good thing overall. Uh, I definitely hope it doesn't hurt the open source software ecosystem. I don't think it will, but it will definitely, you know, software manufacturers and suppliers will start to take a pause and take a look at what they're integrating into their product, knowing that they're not responsible for it. Yeah, I think that's a good thing mm -hmm. overall. Uh, you can contrast this actually to uh, that sort of parallel um, bill or regulation movement, or I'm not quite sure the correct terms, uh, going on in Europe right now, the Cyber Resiliency Act, which has gotten a ton of discussion. Um, the CRA or Cyber Resiliency Act uh, fails to make that distinction between open source software that's consumed without a vendor relationship and software that's consumed with contracts, procurement, money changing hands, um, and an actual vendor relationship. Um, and uh, depending on your interpretation, um, a lot of folks, a lot of uh, really important open source communities and foundations um, are really worried that the CRA in Europe is going to place uh, ridiculous amounts of undue burden on open source uh, maintainers, which might even make their use and distribution inside of European markets untenable. Um, open source uh, maintainers uh, could be held liable for flaws in open source if it's used in Europe, despite there not being any contract set up, despite them not re receiving any uh, compensation back. Um, it kind of flips around the whole open source movement in a way that uh, is worrying a lot of folks in the community. Um, have you paid any attention to that one? Yeah, I have. I, I touched on that in the book yeah. too. And, you know, I think it's really unfortunate the wording and the way that played out is because as you point out, you know, they're, they're not being compensated for this. They're often doing this on their own free will and free time. Uh, and we have this vibrant, you know, thriving ecosystem, open source software uh, maintainers and contributors and people that participate in this ecosystem. Uh, and now if they're going to, you know, if they feel like they're threatened or going to be underneath some kind of requirement that puts them at some legal peril, uh, they may be more reluctant to participate in that. Uh, and it's really uh, concerning that, you know, it was worded the way it is. And I think that that's, you know. It happens sometimes when I think when we see policy uh, folks making policy that don't have a, a background in technology, uh, like, you know, for example, we previously saw, you know, the NDAA, you know, phrase uh, vulnerability free software. Uh, and it was like, that's. I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's really critical that we have technologists involved in the policy making process. Uh, so they can point out, you know, things that maybe you just wouldn't think of from a legislative or policy perspective where you just aren't familiar with, you know, from not being a hands-on technologist per se. Uh, so I hope they rectify that, but it's definitely concerning for sure. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Then that final exclusion, um, you kind of hinted at a little bit, uh, software developed by federal agencies um, is immune here. Um, can you shed any light on why you think that might be? Is it just because you know it doesn't go through the typical procurement process, so it's kind of silly um, to apply it in the same way, or uh, is there some other reason that was specifically called out? You know, I can't uh, say for sure one way or the other, but it is concerning in the sense that, you know, we've had no shortage of federal agencies that have had many notable uh, data breaches that have impacted millions of people in some cases. Uh, you know, so I think that they need to be held to the same level of rigor and requirement as industry. And then also it's, it's a little bit uh, contradictory and it sends the wrong message like, you know, you must do this, but we don't have to do this. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, you know, the federal systems do go through, you know, the risk management framework and they have an authority to operate process and things like that. But typically it doesn't have uh, that level of rigor around secure software development practices and open source software consumption. Uh, so I think that it needs, you know, federal systems and technology need to come along for the ride and, and you know, be under the same requirements as industry to some extent. You know, otherwise it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, like I said, contradictory and it sends a kind of a wrong message, I think, to industry that they're not in this with them. Yeah, it could definitely be interpreted that way. But I guess you're saying uh, the federal government hasn't found the magic secret to writing software without vulnerabilities. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Yeah, not yet. <laughs>
Um, we have seen a whole bunch of uh, guidance released from different agencies this year. Um, I think uh, probably about six months ago, or maybe a little longer now, the NSA released some of their guidance on secure software development that um, they released it for the entire industry to read. A lot of it was great. Um, there were some funny sessions in there around uh, not using uh, the laptop that you use to write software, not using it for any other purpose, no internet access, no checking email. Um, and some of that could definitely help, but it's not quite realistic for the rest of the industry. So it points out that there do need to be some differences here in place. Yeah, the NSA series is great. Uh, I, I I touched on that again in the book. You know, not to put not to plug the book too much, but I definitely cover that series, uh, ESF uh, series that NSA put out. And there's some great uh, guidance in there, and they put it from you know different perspective of a supplier, you know, uh, a consumer, for example. So depending on you and and your use case, you know, often you you tend to be more than one, but you can definitely dig into that guidance and make use of it. And and there's some great stuff in there. Awesome. Um. All right, let's move on to talking about the form itself. Uh, we did a pretty good explanation of how we got here so far. Um, how do you think this form will help uh, in improving, uh, making security forward software accessible to the government? All of that fun stuff. And obviously starting with the elephant in the room, which is the title itself. This is the self-attestation form, which implies uh, people get to attest to it themselves. <laughs> Um, let's start there. I know you, you, uh, you've drawn some historical conclusions. You pointed to some uh, other recent attempts of something that starts this way and how it tends to work out in the government. What do you think the implication of starting with a self-attestation is? Yeah, this is a really uh, interesting topic, and it's a it's a challenging problem. No matter which way you look at it, you know, you approach it. Um, and I, in the article that you're talking about, I point out parallels between NIST 800-171 and the cybersecurity maturity. Uh, model uh, certification from, you know, CMMC, as they call it, in the defense industrial base. Uh, and this came about because, you know, organizations that were doing work with the federal government had some pretty significant data breaches that exposed, you know, uh, you know, robust uh, research and development for weapon systems and things like that. Uh, and they had been basically self-attesting, you know, that they were doing these security controls and practices. Uh, but as it turned out, incidents proved that that didn't seem to be the case. And then also third party, you know, analysis also kind of point out that that wasn't the case. Um, so self-attestation, you know, I, uh, a little plug here for Jim Dempsey. He has an excellent blog series on Lawfare blog on, you know, third party attestation versus uh, first party or self-attestation. Uh, and each of them has their unique uh, uh, benefits and drawbacks. A uh, self-attestation obviously is much faster and easier and scalable, right? You know, I can have everyone just kind of self-attest to this. Uh, but on the flip side of that, there's no real validation by a third party that these things that are being claimed to be done are actually done. Uh, but the, the challenge there is if you introduce a third party, like FedRAMP has a third party uh, uh, assessment organization involved. As I said, you know, you have 300 approved offerings in a market of tens of thousands. Imagine trying to have a third party go out and evaluate every software manufacturer selling software to the federal government and examine their software development practices and their artifacts and things like that. Uh, so it's a very tricky paradigm to walk that self-attestation versus third-party attestation, you know, or, or assessment, you know, uh, approach. Uh, and I, you know, even though there's drawbacks and concerns with self-attestation, I think this is the right way to uh, approach it initially. Otherwise, it would be really cumbersome and, and, you know, bureaucratic and heavy on the industry to try to meet this with a, the introduction of yet another third-party attestation framework, basically. Yeah, a lot of the discussion I've seen around here seems to say, yeah, we're just starting with self-attestation to get something done while well, we can, you know, train up and get that cottage industry of SSDF auditors ready and uh, aware of what they're supposed to be looking for. Um, so this way we don't have to stop the world while we wait for it. But it is a completely different model. Um, you know, a lot of the discussion I heard early on said, yeah, this is just going to be a checkbox. Everyone's just going to fill it out so they don't lose their contracts. Uh, but after reading the draft, um, it starts out with a pretty serious tone, right? This is expected to be signed by the CEO of a company selling software to the government. Um, and right under that, they point out the exact um, law that you'd be violating if you lie on that form. Uh, and this is not a civil penalty, right? This isn't you lose your contracts. This isn't you get fined if you screw up. Um, it, right there points to up to five years in prison if you lie on this form. Um, I know Dr. Allen and a lot of other folks, when we talk about SBOMs and accuracy, always love to point out um, it is already a crime to lie to the federal government. Um, everyone should know that already, uh, but it is pretty serious to start out this form by calling that out and reminding folks. Um, as the CEO of a company, you know, reading that, um, I get worried, right? Um, uh, in a lot of these cases, I'd rather have a third party come in and take on some of that liability and do those checks just so I'm not um, personally held accountable uh, if a mistake is made. Um, do you think it's really going to be kind of glossed over and just checked off to keep things moving, or do you think folks are going to take this seriously? 
I think, uh, you know, given the language that's there, I think uh, it will be taken pretty seriously. At least I hope it would be given the, the consequences or potential consequences for failing to do so. Um, and then, you know, uh, as you point out, they do use language that kind of infers that maybe as time goes on, it will mature to have, you know, I hate to use the term cottage industry like you did, but, you know, another industry of, you know, assessors and organizations that come out and validate these things. Uh, so I think it's going to take some time to mature and give, you know, assessors some time to learn SSDF and how to assess, you know, for organizations complying with SDS, SSDF and things like that. Um, but I think te- people are going to take it seriously, especially when the CEO is signing it or someone signing it on behalf of the CEO. Uh, but that said, it's going to, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity in there in terms of if, if an incident happens, you got to go in now and, and specifically prove, you know, that a certain practice wasn't done or something like, or that they knew, for example, that a practice wasn't done. Uh, so definitely, you know, I'm not a legal scholar, uh, but I imagine that this can get pretty muddy if you had to like go enforce something like this in a, in a complicated incident, you know, in, in, in a large complex environment, for example. Uh, but I think given the language there, you know, just to end on that note, I think people will take it seriously. At least I hope uh, if I was a CEO, I certainly would be taking it pretty seriously. Yeah, yeah, there's there's not a lot to joke about in there. And there's a lot of a lot of controls that I think are going to surprise folks as they actually zoom into those requirements. Um, I have some guesses at what's going to be challenging uh, and most challenging just from the organizations I've talked to to comply with. But let's start with you. Is there anything in there that you think is really going to be uh, tough for, for companies as they start reading this and start trying to get uh, in shape to be able to attest? I, uh, you know, there's some great ones in there. I'm curious to hear what which ones jump out to you. But for me, there were some, you know, one of the practices called out re- regarded uh, the provenance of the components used. Um, and most organizations don't even know what components they're using, let alone where they came from. Uh, you know, so I think that that's, that's in particular going to be one that's really challenging for folks to comply with. How about you? What was, uh, you know, one that you know, jumped out to you? Yeah, that one definitely jumped out to me for those same reasons, right? Uh, you know, S-bombs um, have, you know, been a huge topic of conversation for a few years now. And most organizations that I've talked to were struggling to even begin to find the information required to fill out an S-bomb. Um, and an SBOM or a software bill of materials is like, you, know, you can think of it as the list of ingredients, you know, the components that are actually going into your software or solution. Or provenance is taking it one step farther back and uh, making sure that you got those components uh, from where they were supposed to come from. Um, integrity was checked along the way that things were built responsibly. Um, so looking even farther upstream, it's kind of that provenance aspect of it. And that's mentioned a couple times in those requirements. I think that one is definitely going to be pretty challenging. Um, the other aspect of it, which some of this stuff is already kind of applied to FedRAMP or is, you know, depending on exactly how you interpret some of the FedRAMP requirements, already part of FedRAMP, but the vulnerability management requirements. Those are always challenging and always lead to stacks and stacks of poems for everyone I've talked to. Um, do you think that's going to be a challenge here? Do you think this is getting broader or is this just kind of a different take on the same aspect? I think it's a, that's another good one to call out. You know, As I was digging into the software supply chain topic and doing a lot of writing and reading on this, uh, you know, it, it really is a challenging problem. And, and historically, as we've you know done it as an industry, there's a big difference between a vulnerability versus an exploitable vulnerability. Uh, and as you point out, they have to have processes that show that reasonable steps were taken to, you know, address the security of third party components. What exactly does reasonable steps mean? You know, that's where you can kind of get into subjective, debatable uh, aspects of this when it comes to vulnerability management. There's some pretty different, you know, strong differences of opinion on what reasonable might be, you know, depending if you're the supplier or you're the consumer, uh, you're different, you know, your opinion uh, may vary. So I think that's another great one to point out too. Yeah. And a lot of this is, you know, removing ambiguity is one of the main goals of NIST when they publish documents like this. It's an attempt to codify in a less ambiguous way what industry standard best practices are. So that way we all have something to refer to. Uh, But jumping into that, since, you know, I know you've read that document, I read that document. Um, as folks start to think about filling out this form and complying with stuff from the SSDF, um, what would you advise organizations as they start down this journey? Yeah, I mean, first up, I would I would start to understand, you know, I kind of made a little of a list of what I would do if I was under, under the purview of this form. You know, I would start to understand, like, what software that I produce, you know, meets these requirements in terms of the date that it was made, you know, the, the type of de- development practices, if it if it's SAS, if it uses CICD, for example, you know, when was the late uh, latest date of a major change? Uh, you know, as the things we talked about earlier, for example, understanding what software underneath, you know, my purview is, uh, is this form applicable to and these requirements and practices. Uh, and then from there, I would definitely go get familiar with SSDF. You know, there's been a lot of talk about this uh, form, you know, only being 
uh, uh, covering a subset of SSDF practices. Uh, but I would definitely recommend going and getting familiar with the broader SSDF, you know, for example, to understand it at depth. And then, you know, narrow in from there on the specific practices that the form calls out. Uh, and then next thing I would do in that in that you know step is to go and look at my software development practices, my environments, my configurations, you know, uh, the, my methodologies, and see you know how do I measure up to these requirements and where do I have gaps? Uh, how do I start to address these gaps? And then you know uh, you know using the term POAM for example, maybe internally I start to you know do a little bit of a gap analysis and say hey we are doing these things but we're not doing these practices and we have some gaps or you know deficiencies that we need to address. And then working with your security and development teams to come up with a plan of you know how we're going to address these uh, deficiencies and by when, uh, because you're going to need to provide that information to the government nonetheless. You know, not only internally do you need that to, to meet the requirements, but you need to provide to the government if you are, you know, if you do have gaps and deficiencies, for example. Um, and then, you know, moving on from there, you're going to likely need to engage, you know, potentially a third party in some cases, if you don't have robust, you know, secure software development uh, expertise internally. You know, start to engage a third party who can help you come in and, and understand like your practices as they are versus where they need to be and make recommendations, you know, whether uh, process and methodology wise or technology, you know, uh, centric type recommendations to kind of bolster your software development practices and meet those gaps. And then also, you know, uh, finally, I would wrap it up with like discussing this with my federal, you know, counterpart, you know, hey, hey, how are you all doing? Uh, on, on implementing these requirements. Are you guys prepared to receive these forms? You know, do you have, you know, having that conversation with them, because a lot of agencies are, you know, while suppliers are going through this process and getting familiar with the requirements, agencies are also in the same position, just on the other end of the equation, you know, they're trying to understand, hey, what do people need to be doing and what do they need to give me and by when and in what format, you know? Um, so agencies are trying to get familiar with this as well. Uh, so have that conversation with your federal counterpart and you might be surprised, you know, they may be further down the road of already working towards this or they may, you know, not even be tracking this. And then, you know, you might bring it to their attention in some cases. Uh, so I definitely would have that conversation with them too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I hope nobody is surprised when they start getting emails with these forms and controls and documentation, but you never know. Um, there's kind of some parallels there that you just kind of reminded me about with the overall SBOM, you know, effort and initiative and state of, state of the SBOM world, um, where agencies are supposed to start collecting those um, sort of as part of this, but sort of separately as well. Um, and a lot of organizations are trying to figure out what to do with them, who to send them to, where. Um, you know, we've gotten asked a few times, and it's ranged from everything over, can you send us a link to it, to can you attach it as a PDF to this email? Um, you kind of joked about some of this earlier on, too, with the whole effort around machine-readable stuff. And, you know, this is just a, a PDF that you get to DocuSign or, or sign on a piece of paper. Um, do you think this is the start of like that whole chicken and egg cycle around, well, somebody's got to provide it before tooling to consume it and use it can get built. Nobody's going to start providing it though. If nobody's going to ask for it, um, you kind of just have to start somewhere. Um, yeah. Where do you think we're going to start here? Emails? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I think we are going to start with these static documents. But yeah. uh, as you point out, it's, it's, you know, kind of a chicken and an egg where people are going to start to say, hey, is there a better way I can send this to you? Is there a more automated, you know, um, technical way I can send you this artifact in a, in a continuous fashion versus, you know, just this hand signed PDF that I need to email or upload manually to a website. Uh, and, and it's just like S-bombs, you know, it's, it's kind of like, what are you going to do with it now? Like, you need to have a solution on your end on the federal agency side to say, hey, here's how we're going to ingest these, you know, here's how we'll uh, start to collect these forms and make use of them and, and, you know, make them part of our broader cybersecurity supply chain risk management program, for example. Um, so, yeah, de definitely a lot of parallels there. And I think it's, uh, it's funny to see the same situation happening here as we saw, you know, play out with SBOM, for example. Uh, I, I did want to make one quick note. Um, you made me laugh because one of the recent SBOM uh, documents that came out says you can even receive it in oral format. So like someone can read off the SBOM to you uh, as a method of delivery, which I thought was pretty interesting because we're going to off that list, you know? And we've seen uh, yeah, XML files, JSON files, and now you're saying we're going to get MP3 recordings of people reading SBOMs. That's <laughs> That's going to be fun. Um, I'm going to, you'll have to have a sharp ear to spot vulnerabilities in that. Um, man, that's amazing. Um, I, I, okay, so we talked about best practices for organizations that are going to start filling these out. Um, what if we flip it around? Because you kind of get to where both that's here. What are some best practices you tell the government agencies on what to do with these forms when they do start getting them and get, start getting overwhelmed with them? Yeah, I, I would say definitely start to work towards the solution of, like I said, integrating these into your broader supply chain risk management programs, because if it becomes something that you just get and you throw it in a folder and you never look at it, you never really make use of it, uh, you're not doing much in the way of driving down organizational risk. Uh, 
uh, when you look at your software supply chain. So I would take these artifacts and find a way to actually, you know, get the information that's actionable or insightful from them. You know, think about if you have a, a, ton, a ton of uh, suppliers, for example, and they obviously are going to have their own, you know, different unique POEMs and deficiencies. I want to understand that, you know, across my software supply chain ecosystem, you know, what are the deficiencies that my suppliers have and who has them and what are they planning to do about them and when? You know, getting that information at scale is going to be really challenging if you're just doing it from a, a collection of PDF documents in a folder. Uh, you need to get this information into like, you know, a database, a, uh, you know, security data lake, you know, things like that where you can like, uh, visit, you know, have visibility in terms of uh, the deficiencies across your software supply chain, your supplier base. Uh, so definitely, you know, working towards a solution that has, you know, some scalability is, is going to be the way to get value from these versus just throwing them in a folder and checking the box and moving on. Yeah, do you think this is going to be like Boolean? People either fill it out or they don't, or do you think it's going to be similar to SBOMs where eventually it can make its way even further left and into the procurement process, where if you've got two vendors on a competing solution, um, the data in here could be useful to help figure out which one has you know the best security posture, let alone just meeting this minimum bar. Do you think we're going to see that in the future? Yeah, I definitely think so. I know that you know folks that I talk to at certain agencies are looking at this from that perspective of how can I take, you know, things like an SBOM, for example, or in this case, you know, these self-attestation forms and make them actionable for my procurement team or my acquisition teams uh, to understand, like, you know, if I'm looking for a solution that does X and there's two or three of them, I can start to understand, you know, which one has more rigorous software development practices, which one has, you know, less deficiencies and, and less POAMs, for example, in some of these SSDF practices. Uh, so it, it can be a competitive differentiator when we start to see this language, you know, these requirements make it into things like uh, the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulation, for example, or start to make it into organizational, you know, acquisition and procurement processes. Uh, so, it, you know, I, it, while it may appear as just a checkbox, when you're talking about selling and competing in the market against other suppliers that have similar capabilities, that could be a competitive differentiator for sure. Yeah, I hope we get beyond just, is there an SBOM awesome, or is this checked awesome and moving on? Uh, because there is a lot of great data in there. And to your point, publishing this as a company and you know showing exactly how far you go here will hopefully be something that uh, buyers look for too. Um, hopefully not even just at the federal government. Um, everyone buying software out there should be paying attention to the practices from their vendors. Yeah, most definitely. I think this is, you know, while the government, it's a unique situation in the sense that the government is kind of leading the charge, you know, which yeah. is, typically, you know, industry leads the way and government tends to, to be a laggard in a lot of cases. Uh, but on this topic, the government has taken it pretty seriously since the cybersecurity executive order. And there's been a rapid fire succession of, you know, publications and guidance and requirements since then. Uh, and I think industry is going to be, you know, it would be wise to look at their software supply chain and practices of their suppliers and things like that, too, because, uh, they're just as much at risk as anyone else uh, procuring and using software from a third party. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. This is one of those rare times um, where the requirements coming out of the federal government are you know, much higher than what I've typically seen across industry. Um, I've thought about that a lot on why. And you know, I think, you know, my, I don't know if I'm right. I'd love to hear your thoughts after. But I think it's because of the nature of supply chain. It's kind of a distributed problem. Nobody's really in a position to fix this themselves. We're all somewhere in the software supply chain. Most of us are somewhere kind of in the middle. It's hard for us to really dramatically change the posture of the entire supply chain ourselves. So this is something where it does take a central entity um, like the federal government to start pushing standards because they need to you know, get these implemented all the way across the supply chain. One vendor somewhere in the middle making a change and you know, spending a ton of time and money implementing these controls isn't really gonna have that much of an impact themselves. Um, and so it can kind of feel like, why am I wasting my time if I do all of this and nobody even checks the signatures or looks at the S-bombs I'm making? Um, so yeah. it really does take a central entity to force this along. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> It's it's a massive problem, and I think it's one where we're seeing the federal government step up and use their you know procurement power uh, to try to drive uh, systematic you know uh, institutional change across the entire ecosystem. And they even use uh, you know language in the, in the recent. I know we're not talking about the national cyber strategy here, but they use language in there about you know shifting market forces, for example. Uh, that's not something that one entity in the software supply chain is going to do, but it is something that the federal government you know can do via regulation and other mechanisms. Uh, and it's you know it's a kind of a like you said. It's an intractable problem that it requires someone the size of the government to get involved to make a you know systematic change across the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's another great uh, jumping point. I'll just jot it down so we don't forget. But I do want to talk a little bit about the cybersecurity strategy too because that's really exciting. Uh, but let's wrap up the self-attestation form a little bit more before we just keep going down tangents. 
Um, the request for comments is open right now, right? So this isn't final yet. Um, do you have any specific recommendations on how to improve this form itself or the overall process before it does get locked in? Um, like you, I think the practices in there are good and definitely solid recommendations. I would recommend that we find a more efficient way to handle these forms. Uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of traction, like we said, from machine readable artifacts, S bombs, you know, VEX, and, and you know, everything is moving infrastructure as code, policy as code, and then we have this PDF document. Uh, and it's going to be really hard for organizations to just ingest these at scale. And, and, and you can maybe ingest them and throw them in a folder. But if you want to make use of these to, to understand your software supply chain and the risk, uh, these need to be machine readable. So you can pull the information out of it and present it in a better, you know, a scalable way. Uh, so I really hope we see, you know, it mature, if not, you know, immediately upon the re release of the final you know, version, but soon after, hopefully, uh, some kind of machine readable format for this, because I really think it's going to be hard for agencies that have hundreds or thousands of suppliers to, you know, do this via PDF. Yeah, especially when it comes to the documentation around the controls and the practices, because, yeah, without having this in some kind of standard format that explains what everyone is doing, it's going to be hard to get beyond just that Boolean, did the vendor sign it or not um, aspect. All these PDFs are just going to end up in an inbox somewhere that's hard to extract any data out of. Um, coming on to the next part, if everybody does just fill out these PDFs, attach tons of screenshots of, you know, the GitHub settings being configured correctly and different practices being in place, um, is it going to be hard to validate that any of this is accurate? Um, is that even a goal at this point? I mean, that's uh, that's kind of the the inference of uh, self-attestation. is They're essentially just taking the word of the supplier in this case. Uh, no one's going behind to validate these things. I mean, they may look to see, did you provide the artifact in the right format? Or some accompanying, you know, uh, uh, proof or or supporting documentation, but no one's actually going out to validate these things in the uh, suppliers' environments. Uh, so there is that, you know, essentially inferred uh, trust, uh, which is ironic. You know, we hear a lot about zero trust, and we're placing a lot of trust right now in our suppliers to do the right things and uh, attest to doing so. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, that's something we can move beyond uh, as we get this rolled out as part of the industry. Um, all right, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, let Let's talk about the overall kind of practice that we're seeing here of public and private collaboration, the federal sector working with industry. Um, you started out by mentioning this at the beginning, but you recently joined CISA as a cyber fellow. Um, what are some other ways that government agencies in the industry can collaborate to make sure that the practices that are being required and recommended here by the government are actually practical and provide a meaningful impact to everyone? I think uh, some of the best ways is just getting government representation involved in some of these communities that we see, you know, things like uh, CNCF or OpenSSF and other organizations that have these robust communities of people that are passionate about uh, software development and delivery and such. Uh, getting government representatives involved in these communities, hearing from them firsthand on the challenges of complying with the requirements or better ways of doing things or more scalable, automatable uh, ways of doing things. Uh, and then obviously, you know, we can do a whole session on, on the government's challenges with workforce attraction and retainment. Uh, but that's a big piece of it is getting the right people into government uh, so that they, we do see policies that are coherent and make sense and are drawn from practical experience, you know, when it comes to software development and cybersecurity. Um, so I think that, you know, just getting out there and getting involved in community and being part of the community can go a long way for the government. Awesome. From, from folks that work in the community on that side, is there anything we can do to make it easier for folks in the government to participate? Uh, I would say, you know, uh, just having things be virtual helps sometimes. You know, it's great to get in person, but the government, you know, doesn't always have the, you know, believe it or not, doesn't have the robust uh, budget or flexibility to travel to attend events sometimes that, you know, you might have as a civilian working in this industry. Uh, so having events be virtual, you know, just, uh, you know, being open and collaborative and being out there, you know, can, can go a long way. And then don't be afraid to reach out and engage, you know, your government counterparts. Uh, they may not know who you are or what you're up to. So just getting out there and communicating them, hey, we have this community of interest or a special interest group and we're working on this problem. We would love to have a representative from, you know, agency X, Y and Z, uh, you know, just crossing the aisle, so to say, I guess, from industry to government could help a lot. Oh, man. So no more open source summits in Maui or Nice or anything like that. <laughs> um, cool. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Let's jump over to your book now a little bit. Um, you've talked about the general theme of transparency a ton. Um, we're seeing transparency uh, used to help in cybersecurity, both in the SBOM initiative, just around knowing the ingredients, but also here publishing your actual practices. Um, how would you frame the overall role of transparency um, in both self-attestation, but then further as we get to third-party attestations? 
Yeah, I think historically there's been this information asymmetry between, you know, software suppliers and software consumers, you know, whether we're talking enterprise environments or citizens. Uh, you know, we're seeing event, like we're talking here about, you know, requirements that are emerging for the government to understand their software suppliers and have more transparency there. Uh, but there's also other efforts underway, like you talked about the Cyber Resiliency Act. Uh, we're seeing efforts on NIST for, you know, cybersecurity labeling just to help consumers make more informed decisions around, uh, you know, secure products, for example. Uh, so we've had this weird situation where just like open source, you know, as a society, we've made more and more use of software. It's in, it's in everything we do. Every aspect of society is now dependent for some, you know, to some extent almost on software. Yet, you know, we really haven't understood, you know, the transparency aspect of it. What's inside of it? You know, where did it come from? Who created it? You know, what methods and practices were made, you know, used to create it? Uh, so I think that's why we're seeing transparency, uh, you know, make such a big push. And, uh, you know, we think about things like zero trust and how imperative it is for securing the modern enterprise. Well, it's the same thing for society. We need to have trust and that trust requires transparency. That's a great way to put it. All right, well, I think we covered a ton. So I do see a couple of questions here in chat. We also have a QA feature, um, which has a couple of questions. Oh, it looks like we copied some of the ones from chat over into it. Um, let's start with this top one. And I'm not sure if you can actually answer this one um, yourself, Chris, because of your role, but we can maybe do some uh, research or follow up after. But uh, does SIS intend to release resources to help vendors when filling out the form? Uh, so I don't, you know, I'm still in the process of onboarding there, so I can't say definitively, but I am hoping to find out. And I imagine if they're going to push a requirement out to this, you know, it's going to impact this large of a group of individuals and organizations, they have to put out some accompanying guidance. Uh, so I think that I, I think they should, if they're not planning to, they definitely should. Awesome. We'll, we'll stay tuned there. Next one, um, and maybe you know this, uh, I'm not familiar with this particular uh, acronym from OWASP, but maybe you are, Chris. Yeah. What would be your opinion of using OWASP SAMM to meet NIST SSDF requirements? Yeah, so that, uh, you know, I might butcher the acronym, but it's, uh, it's, I want to say it's Secure Application Maturity Model Assessment from OWASP. Uh, and, and the interesting, the cool thing about NIST SSDF is like, you know, you know how government is in particular. Something happens, they go create something new. Uh, but in SSDF's case, they went into drawn from industry on a lot of different guidance like BSIM and OWASAM, and they went and mapped it to those different frameworks and, and practices, for example. So like I talked about earlier, you know, uh, to go familiarize yourself with SSDF, if you do so and go down into the table of the practices, they have a column on the right that maps to OWASAM and maps to BSIM. Uh, so you can start to do a crosswalk and say, hey, we're, you know, we use SAM. Uh, SSDF, maybe this new version obviously is new, but we use SAM and we know we're doing X, Y, and Z. So now you can crosswalk that to the SSDF practices that you know you need to meet now. Uh, so definitely, you know, the, definitely be using OWASP SAM if you aren't already because you can crosswalk it to SSDF. You know, it, it lines up uh, obviously not 100% across all practices, but many of the practices do map to SAM if you dig into that table. Yeah, that table is full of references and cross mapping. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at it, there's that final column all the way to the right, which is the list of references. And that one is the longest column in the entire table. Uh, so it's really just a, a compendium of uh, information and controls from other places. All right, next one. How do you see the use of subcontractors and outsourcing on the ability of a company to self-attest truthfully versus hiding bad aspects of their development process? Do you see anything explicitly in the form to cover these issues? This is a this is an interesting question uh, from Jeff here. I'm probably gonna have a follow up conversation via LinkedIn with him on this one. Um, but this, you know, I, I'm thinking I, of memes right now. <laughs> no, I mean, there's definitely a scenario I think where people could try to just like on the open source front, try to push liability onto their subcontractors or you know people further down in the supply chain. It's definitely gonna roll downhill. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, trying to hide bad aspects of development processes, they may do that by pushing it down to the, you know, uh, subcontractors, uh, you know, other suppliers in the supply chain that maybe provide some aspects of software to them. Uh, so it, that's a tricky one. And, and I, de I definitely think it's, you know, as you point out, the modern software supply chain is incredibly complex. Organizations are relying on third parties, you know, other suppliers to do certain aspects of development practices and activities. Um, it's going to be a big problem. Yeah, um, that's a good one. And I thought of the perfect meme. I'll get it posted as soon as we get out of here. <laughs> um, all right, well, thanks again for joining us today. Um, I think we, we covered uh, the entire SSDF, some of the history, and I loved hearing you know your thoughts uh, with your unique seat and point of view here as somebody that's played uh, on both sides, helping organizations meet this stuff, and now gets to help out um, in the CISA um, advisors program that you're a part of. Is there anything else you want to leave the audience with, 
No, just uh, happy to have the opportunity to come here and chat and appreciate the great questions from the audience. And uh, as any time, you know, find me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat about these things and I'm always uh, learning alongside everyone else. So just happy to be a uh, part of the uh, industry here. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining.